Huge GPU clusters in the form of data centers have perhaps been the biggest investments ever known to man. We're about to watch a clip predicting perhaps another cycle just as large in the AI space might be on its way and that AMD could be a huge benefactor of it. Check this out. What's happening with AI now is that it's pretty obvious for everyone, not just the AMD bulls, the longtime AMD bulls, that AI is moving out from the data center. Of course, there will be a lot of AI in data centers, but essentially every single machine on the planet will need an inference chip to use AI and do something useful with it. Essentially, my view is that AMD is positioned to take the whole inference market. And that is because when you perform inference as on a device, you basically have less space and you have a smaller battery much less power than you would do in a, on a data center, in a data center. So there's thermodynamic requirements that force you to be much more efficient in order to use AI at the edge, essentially. Now, this market is going to explode over the next five to seven years, I believe. Potentially could take eight to really come to fruition, but it's going to be physical AI is basically going to be one of the big, big end markets, at least as big as NVIDIA's data center market is today. Now, AMD is valued just a few hundred billion dollars, just to give you the exact number, $279 billion. And so if it does turn out that they have a roadmap, which I believe is so well suited for physical AI and actually a bunch of other markets, but just take one, which is physical AI, AI at the edge. If it does turn out that this does become one of the primary markets for AI, at least as big as the data center market today, and AMD has this unique competitive advantage, then this becomes a multi-trillion dollar company. As many of you know, I'm long AMD since 2014, since $4.2 per share. So at $420 per share, I'll be up 100x. But I actually believe that this is going to get much bigger. Because at $420 per share, AMD is still nowhere near the end market cap it could attain if it does actually become the primary player in physical AI, which again, is just AI at the edge. Again, why do I believe this is happening? And, and why do I believe the market is now starting to price this in aggressively? If you look at AMD's AI PCs, so the chips that they recently launched over the past year to bring AI PCs to the market, they really are. And I think, you know, people have had such a tough time wrapping their head around this over the past year, but they really just are a CPU and an FPGA combined. The FPGA is the chip that I've talked about so many times here on the channel, which basically reconfigures itself on the go changes shape in order to run different neural networks more efficiently. So it basically takes on the shape of the neural network at the circuit level, and that enables you to optimize AI workloads, specifically inference, in a way that no other chip can. It's this, this roadmap is not science fiction. It's happening already because that is how AMD is now essentially growing its client segment so fast. AI PCs powered by AMD are selling very quickly because customers find them useful. And, you know, firstly, the OEMs are buying the chips. And then eventually, I think over the next few years, we'll see end consumers just using AI for everything when it comes to PCs, essentially. Okay, firstly, I wanted to make sure that clip was as accessible to everyone as possible. So I asked Rock to define FPGAs for idiots like me. Uh, so an FPGA is a flexible chip that can be reprogrammed to handle AI tasks like real-time video processing or autonomous driving, making it perfect for edge AI. Edge AI is AI not in the data centers, it's out in the cars, in robots. Or the robots. Like, yep. Or the robots, stuff like that. AMD, according to Grok, leads in Edge AI with offering high performance, low power, which is important, and adaptability for smart devices such as drones or 5G networks. So I think to break down that clip, maybe first we want to break down two of the key assumptions. One of the key assumptions is that edge AI is going to be huge and moving away from data centers, or it's going to be as big as the data centers. So do you firstly agree with that? Um, how big do you think edge AI is going to be? And do you think it is a comparable market to data centers? A hundred percent. It is going to be huge. Um, you know, there are obviously different ways that robots and computers are going to provide value to people. But 
what we saw, I think, in the Web 2.0 Cambrian explosion of technology over the last decade is probably a good rough analogy for what we're looking forward to. You know, that we got a lot more powerful devices in our hands and that but then there's this beautiful and complicated interrelationship between the data like the experience that you have as an end consumer on that phone and where computing actually happened to provide you with that experience. And a lot of it happens right there on your device, but then a lot of it still happens in clouds somewhere. And so the situation that you would actually be interacting with something that was cloud-based versus local, you know, that changes based on the context of whatever you're doing. And so, you know, if you're watching YouTube videos, well, those are stored in a cloud somewhere that's far away. But then if you're doing other things on your phone, all that data lives locally. and in order for the ultimate hopes and dreams and possibilities of what this technology is going to offer to be brought into the real world, you need that existence of both cloud computing, strong networking, and then local computing. And then you need to be able to shift around, uh, you know, what is being computed in the cloud, what is being computed locally, uh, what is being transferred over networks, over what speeds, and yes, and I agree that, you know, like if you look at the the amount of chips that people have, like the total computing power of just every iPhone on the planet, that the magnitude of that amount of computing power is insanely huge. And then, you know, especially if you, okay, now add in all the Samsung handsets and all the LG handsets and, you know, everything that's made by Huawei and all the Chinese phone manufacturers, like it is a gargantuan amount of total compute that exists in cell phones. And I think that the magnitude of edge compute now that's not just going to be on cell phones, but like he said, every, you know, every robot, which there's going to be a whole lot, lot more robots, all sorts of machines that we already use today that exist that just haven't been uh, imbued with this intelligence yet. Those are going to also have computing power on them. So like the magnitude of applications that we're going to apply this type of dynamic where we're we're putting essentially it's going to be you know the cell phone for every major device in the world that's just going to be an incredible amount of total computing power that we're we're going to build we're going to generate it we're going to install it we're going to integrate it in applications near far and, and wide and it's it's going to be it is going to be massive and at the same time we're also going to be continuing to build out massive data centers and so yeah like i think Thinking about them as roughly equivalent in orders of magnitude is correct. Okay, so that that's the first assumption. The edge market is going to be gigantic and as big as data centers, or at least in that order of magnitude. The second one then is, is AMD the leader or potentially going to be the leader in the edge AA market? So how well positioned do you see AMD to be there? Because if so, that's an enormous opportunity for another NVIDIA-like moment. Yeah, so I I'm definitely not like an expert in AMD and their business model. I think that they're in a very interesting position that they have a lot of opportunity ahead of them, and especially when you compare their market cap to some of the other big players who have been successful in this area. I think their potential as a an investment opportunity is very high, but I think there are also challenges that uh, Antonio's not really addressing here that I don't, you know, I don't know how to handicap them. Maybe they're not as big of challenges as I think they are. But, you know, what he has described here, these FPGAs, those are field programmable gate arrays. Those are computing devices that you can change the flow of logic, uh, you know, in, in a programmable way. But actually, like the the chips, the logic transistors, you know, all of the the actual computation is configurable. Um, and so you can define how information flows from, you know, one part of the chip to another part of the chip. And so, yes, you can you can define in a much more flexible way how the hardware handles the software computation that you want to do. And that that's very interesting. It's very exciting. It does theoretically offer AMD the ability to provide more efficient inference than and more configurable inference than other architectures. But then you have to ask the question, okay, how hard is it to develop software for that? And what does the software development ecosystem look like that 
enables that. And this is one of the areas where AMD has really struggled in and lagged behind and that NVIDIA has been so successful in. And, uh, you know, NVIDIA, we've already talked before about how they have their CUDA ecosystem, which is the software ecosystem that allows lots of developers to write these brand new AI applications and get a lot of performance out of NVIDIA GPUs for these brand new applications. And it's one of the biggest, richest, most valuable software ecosystems in existence on the planet today. Um, and, you know, is has every indication of continuing to grow. And so, you know, the question will be, can AMD provide developers with the tooling necessary to really attract them into this AMD ecosystem to develop their edge inference software for. And I think that that's going to be a little bit more of a challenge than Antonio has described. Now, I have seen significant progress from AMD over the last specifically 12 months on being much more software focused and really trying to like realizing that they're not going to be able to develop this ecosystem with closed source proprietary stuff that, you know, they do in-house so that they're going to have to rely on creating a community and specifically an open source community to solve the magnitude of this software challenge for them. If they can continue to gain traction in that way, there is a possibility that AMD could create basically, you know, a Linux style equivalent to CUDA uh, over, you know, the coming years. And if that were to happen, uh, I think they do have actually a very strong possibility to capture even more of this inference market. Now that said, so now we're, we've talked about NVIDIA, we've talked about AMD. There's also, you know, people like Tesla that they are developing their own edge AI inference compute uh, with AI4, AI5, AI6. Uh, they have this whole roadmap. They are planning to double down with Samsung from AI6, and then we'll see where it goes from there. But they are taking their destiny into their own hands from a computing standpoint. And then they're also facing all the challenges that come with developing software for those inference computers. And they're trying to develop a platform that is, you know, a, a unified architecture that converges from the, the data center chips to those inference chips. Uh, and th this is another area where NVIDIA, we'll circle back to NVIDIA, is doing as well, that they want to have the same chips actually live on Optimus robots in Tesla cars, that they are also doing a significant portion of their training in the data center with. And so there are some you know, differences in the ways that those chips are packaged and put together and coordinated. But at the end of the day, it is actually the same devices in uh, in the cars as in the the data centers and that allows you to have a very tight feedback between data that you're pulling in from your edge that you want to modify your behavior around and then being able to train on that change that behavior if you need to change it in the cloud you can uh, you've got the same the same architecture so that's interesting nvidia with their you know jetson agx thor release here recently they are putting blackwell gpus in these uh in these chips and so they have kind of a similar architecture that they're moving towards that Elon is doing with the ai6 and and dojo 3 and all unified around their cuda software system and the bet that Jensen is making with that is that, yes, you know, maybe you could theoretically get better performance with an FPGA over Blackwell from an efficiency standpoint that you do more operations with less electricity. But if you create the biggest platform and you push scale as far as possible, that you can actually out compete on the same you know tokens per watt type of metric what people who are are creating these specific you know asics or or fpgas can do 
And so far, he's he's been very successful with that strategy in the data center that we've seen lots and lots of different companies who are trying to build chips that are better than NVIDIA chips. And, you know, there are lots of different ways you can think, OK, NVIDIA chips are inefficient like this. They're inefficient like that. And so if we build our chip over here in a way that eliminates those things, then we can be better than NVIDIA. And we've seen, you know, those companies kind of repeatedly fail to actually deliver on performance that is superior to NVIDIA GPUs. The the Dojo 2 example being uh, one that the audience should be very familiar with that Elon tried to do this with with Dojo and uh, the H100, H200 and uh, Blackwell GPUs that NVIDIA is making seems like they're better at training the types of workloads that Elon has most of the time. And so while they do have Dojo 1 operational, they're going to build Dojo 2. They are going to have some Dojo 2 operational for the majority of workloads. NVIDIA data center GPUs actually still work better. They're more efficient. They're more cost efficient. Uh, they're more power efficient. They're capable of doing more things. And so that's the type of bet that AMD is making is, hey, we can create a more efficient computing platform to do these things than NVIDIA. And because it can be more efficient, well, it obviously must take more market share. And um, it, it's also possible that they'll end up in the same type of position as Dojo or Sarah Bross or, you know, a number of other training compute startups that have come into play over the last few years that are trying to disrupt NVIDIA and the data center, you know, AMD could face the same types of challenges and trying to disrupt NVIDIA at the edge as well. And because, you know, this edge market is not something that Jensen is sleeping on. We talked in a previous episode about how Jensen loves to build platform businesses. He loves to build the widest platform ecosystem possible to enable and empower, you know, the most use cases and he's been thinking about robotics in this way as well. And so you, know, you don't see AMD trying to provide the the total ecosystem to train robots that Jensen and NVIDIA are doing right now. And so that ecosystem that Jensen is creating for robotics is also something that pulls people, developers, you know, technologists into this NVIDIA ecosystem to build their software to run on the edge in the first place. And if they built it there, are they going to leave that then to go over to AMD to run inference because they can do it a little bit more efficiently? Maybe, maybe not. You know, I really don't know. Um, so I'm just much less confident about AMD's ability to take the whole inference market, as Antonio said, than, than he is. You know, I think they have a, a very strong shot at being a player, a significant player, capturing a significant portion of the market share. But I think for me, it's much more likely that they are a minority market shareholder in that market than a majority, much less, you know, the whole thing. That's that's my read on where we're at. 